Good morning and welcome to Cumber Methodist Church. Whether you're here with us in the building or watching online or indeed listening on the telephone line, um, it's lovely that we are gathered together. And if you're visiting with us this morning, you're particularly welcome. As we focus our hearts and minds on the Lord this morning, I want us to hear some words from Psalm 103. And quite often we hear these from the New, New International Version, but this morning I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And it says, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. Father God, as we meet in your presence this morning, whether that be as a gathered people here in the church or in our own homes, Lord, may those words that we have just heard be the prayer of our hearts. Lord, help us this morning to praise you with our whole hearts, holding nothing back. Lord, the things that would worry us concern us that maybe other people find trivial lord we thank you that they are important to you but lord let us set aside all the things that we take up our minds so that our focus would be totally on you this morning lord help us always to remember the good things that you've done for us and help us lord to always give you thanks lord some days that's easier than others some days life seems harder than others but Lord, help us be a people who in all things give thanks to you. Help us to trust in your goodness and never waver whatever situation we are facing. So Lord, this morning as we gather here as your people, help us to praise you with the whole of our being and not just for this hour, but every hour of every day. Amen. We're going to sing together that great hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. If you're able, I would ask you to stand with us as we sing. Let's join together. That psalm, Psalm 103, continues with these beautiful words. The Lord is compassionate 
and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers we bloom and die. The wind blows and we're gone as if we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. And so this morning we come before that compassionate, merciful God who does not hold our sins against us and does not deal with us as we should to confess our sins. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you this morning as your children, knowing that we have not loved you as we should and that we have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. And Lord, our hearts are saddened by all that is wrong in this world, the world that you created in perfection. But Lord, we confess that so often and so, so often it, it pulls at our heartstrings, but yet so rarely are we moved to action. Lord, you have asked for our hands, that you might use them for your purpose. But Lord, we give them only for a moment and then withdraw them for the work seems too hard and we have things of our own to do. And Lord, you ask for our mouths to speak out against injustice. And Lord, if ever there was a time of injustice in our world, it is today. But Lord, we confess this morning that we give you a whisper that we may not be accused by other people. And we refuse to speak out for those who have no voice. You ask for our eyes to see the pain of poverty. And yet, Lord, so easily we close them. We fast forward those things on the TV that would be upsetting to us because we don't want our eyes to be open to the reality of other people's lives. But yet, Lord, we forget to see how well we are how well off compared to those around the world who have so little. And Lord, you've asked for our lives that you might work through us. And yet we give only a small part, afraid of getting too involved, thinking that's a job for someone else. Lord, this morning, would you forgive our poor efforts to serve you? Serving you only when it's convenient for us to do so only in the places that we feel safe, with only those who make it easy to serve. Father, as we meet in your presence this morning, would you forgive us, renew us, and send us out from this place as a usable instrument that we might take seriously the meaning of your cross. Lord, we thank you for the words of this psalm that remind us that you do not punish us for all our sins, nor deal harshly with us as we deserve. Lord, we thank you for your unfailing love towards those who fear you, and that it is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth, and that you have removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. And so help us loving and forgiving God as we join in one voice to mean the words that Jesus taught his disciples as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you were here last week, you'd know that we finished our time of worship with some fellowship for the first in 18, 19 months. We were able to join together for a cup of tea or coffee. Don't worry, the tables aren't set out here this morning, but we will be continuing fellowship in the shell room afterwards. And we hope to do this on an ongoing basis. In case you weren't here last week, just a little reminder of how that's going to work. All those who wish to head on immediately after the service, please feel free to do so. I know some of you have family commitments and for others, you're not yet at a place where you'd feel comfortable sitting around a table with your masks off. That is absolutely fine. So Bill will come to the front as usual when we finish. And those who want to leave straight away, please do so through the shell room, sanitizing your hands again on the way out. For those of us who are going to stay, Sylvia and Kenneth will be in the kitchen today making the tea and coffee, and Chris and David will serve it to you at your tables. So at Bill's direction, go into the shell room, find a seat and a table there. I would remind you that we've got to keep our one metre distance, but while we're sitting around the table, you can take your mask off. The only thing I would remind you to do is that would you please put your mask back on again when you're leaving the building. I noticed a few people last week forgot to do that. That's just one of the things that by law, um, not just Methodist rule, but by law at the minute, when we're entering and leaving the church building, masks must be on. So when you get up to leave from the table or if you need the bathroom or anything, please put your mask back on. But tea and coffee will be served immediately after the service. Next week, we will be continuing our series on shakeable hope and we'll be looking at the promise, joy is coming soon. Last week, we looked about the storms of life. This week, we're looking that death is defeated. So we have looked at how Jesus takes us through the storms. Today, we're looking at that ultimate storm of what happens in death and how Christ defeated it. And next week, we'll be continuing to say, yes, we have sorrow, but weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So that's next Sunday. Um, A reminder for church council, we will meet on Monday the 6th of September at 7.30 in the Shell Room. If you as a congregation have anything that you want to be brought to that meeting, please speak to a member of church council by Thursday the 2nd of September. If you're not in the building, uh, watching online and there's something you want brought, please give one of us a phone or drop us a text, no problem. Um, Chris has asked that the planting team, those involved in organising the planting from the, for the front of the church outside the wall, would you remain afterwards this morning and have a chat with Chris? And finally, you will all have seen on the news over the past week reports of the terrible earthquake in Haiti and the death and destruction it has caused. You know, we prayed about this last Sunday when the reports were just starting to come out. And over the week, it's recorded over 2,000 people have lost their house or lost their lives, and many thousands have been displaced. And people throughout the Methodist Connection in Ireland have been asking, how can we help? So the World Development and Relief Team have got together, and they're working alongside the United Methodist Church in Haiti, uh, our partners out there. And if you wish to give a financial donation towards that, I would ask you to put your gift in an envelope and just mark it Haiti or earthquake, something like that, and put it in the offering plate on your way out. Um, They have said that our money will be used to provide water, food, shelter, clothing and medical care for those affected. If it's a check that you're writing, please don't make it to Cumber Methodist, make it to the Methodist World Development and Relief Fund. Um, If you need any more information on that, come and see me afterwards. That's all our announcements for this morning and David's now going to come and bring us this morning's reading. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of Genesis chapter 3, a story that we all, all know really well. And then we'll hear from the first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15. Thanks, Dave. The reading from Genesis. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? 
Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. They felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire the, to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. And then 1 Corinthians. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into gives us victory over sin and death, strong and immovable, always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Amen. Thanks, Dee. As I said earlier, we're going to read or hear this morning on the topic um, that death is defeated. And it's based on those words, you know, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? And so as we think about death, I want us not to come to it from a place of depression and being morbid but a place of knowing what heaven is going to be like. And so our next hymn is one that's on the video, and it's There is a Higher Throne that gives us a little glimpse of what Scripture tells us heaven is going to be like. So if you're able, please stand as we sing this wonderful hymn as we, before we come to look at Scripture.
there is a famous picture of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, on his deathbed, surrounded by family and friends, and with the satisfaction of a long life well lived. John Wesley's last words are recorded to be, the best of all, God is with us. And that last phrase suggests that John Wesley was a man at peace, knowing and accepting that death was close. And he didn't seem, according to records, to be in any apparent pain. He was 87, but had been active up until his 86th year. And that was 230 years ago on the 2nd of March just past. John Wesley died on the 2nd of March, 1791. It's remarkable to me that what we see in this picture, what we believe to be John Wesley's experience, is what most people today would wish for, for their death. When we consider what would be a good death, it would be to be in our own bed, not in a hospital bed, not somewhere else, surrounded by our family and friends, in as little pain as possible, with a life well lived, knowing that in a moment you would be in God's glory. Death is a subject that few people like to talk about, especially our own death. When I was preparing this during the week, and we were talking about it, and she was able to say to me, what hymns are you singing? And when I told her that the hymn at the end is when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, when the roll is, when the Role is called up yonder, I'll be there. She says, that's my last funeral hymn. And I says, mommy, have you this written down somewhere? Does daddy know what you want? She says, oh yes, and my first hymn is, and my second hymn is. And, and she came across as someone who had no fear whatsoever about death, but someone who was looking forward to seeing God himself. For some of us, that's maybe how we feel. And for others, this morning's topic of death could be very difficult. Maybe it's something you don't like to think about or talk about. There's a guy called Carl Sandberg. He's an American poet. And he's attributed to saying this. The greatest certainty in life is death. The greatest uncertainty is the time. We all know that at some stage, unless the Lord returns, it is a certainty that we face death. The biggest problem with death is we don't know when it's going to be. But the good news is this morning is that we have hope. Yes, modern science, breakthroughs in medicine and in all sort of different studies means that in general, people are living longer and staying well longer and living more active lives longer than the generations that have come before us. But I fear that in doing so, we have lost sight of the fact that death is part of life. We worry that talking about it will upset someone I know with talking to some of the people here in the congregation, they would say, I can't talk about my death because my children don't want to hear about it. And they want to face the fact that death is coming. But for their children and their grandchildren, we want to hold on to people as long as we can. We're worried that we'll upset someone or perhaps we worry about our own death. But by not talking about death, we don't then talk about the hope that is ours, the hope through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Christian faith arose from and centers on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. From its earliest days, the church believed and preached that the resurrection of Jesus guaranteed resurrection to all who joined with him in faith. David read for us earlier from 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read some words from earlier in that chapter. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 23. It says, but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. 
And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection from the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. Now, if that chapter finished there, it would be a very sad place to finish. But the verses go on. It says, And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all them, everyone who belongs to Christ is given a new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. What words of assurance in that passage? If you're thinking about death or the death of a loved one, and I don't want to take away this morning from the pain and suffering caused when we are parted by death from somebody. But you see, whether or not we are Christians, death is unavoidable. It comes to us all. But a Christian death, somebody who dies knowing God and Jesus as their Savior and Lord, death is not the end. It's just an end. It's just an end to how we live here. But it's the beginning of what it will be. For the Christian story points us beyond this life to a continuous life, what we know in Christian circles as eternal life, made possible through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself faced death entered into death and not the ends where it says just as death came through the world into the world through a man that sin of Adam and Eve now the resurrection has begun through another man Jesus Christ I would love to be able to envisage what the garden of Eden was like God made a perfect world nothing died not a plant not an animal, nothing. He made these two humans to walk in the garden and we read in scripture that daily God came down and walked with them. Wow. That was God's ideal for man. That's what God wanted for us as humans, to live in a perfect world, a flourishing world in his presence daily. But that wasn't good enough for man. Man seen one thing that God said he couldn't have. And he wanted it. First the woman, then the man. Taken in by Satan. God's intended creation was ruined by Satan himself. And Satan, we got to acknowledge this morning, is the father of all suffering and death. If it hadn't been for that temptation in the Garden of Eden, if Satan hadn't brought that temptation, there would never be death. There would never be suffering. We only got to look at the book of Job. Job is a horrendous book. If you haven't ever read it, spend some time reading what this poor man of God went through. And Satan asked to test Job to see if he would curse this God that he believed in so much. Satan brought death to Job's sons, daughters, servants, and livestock. And he afflicted him from head to toe with sores. Now imagine that was you. Imagine if in your life you loved the Lord, you were faithful to him, you were at church every week or watching in online as it is at the minute. If you were in... children died on the same day terrible accident 
Imagine if all the business that you had was ruined within a short space of time. Imagine all the servants, if you had them in your household, all died. And in a very short space of time, in the middle of your mourning, you broke out in a horrendous disease where people didn't want to come near you. How would you feel? Well, Job's good intention and wife turned to him and said, for dear sake, will you curse God and die? She thought it would be better off for him. But no. In the book of Job, we read of his struggle to accept the circumstances. We read of how deeply hurting he was. He wasn't sort of some sort of mega Christian who this didn't defect. He hurt deep. He put on his, his sackcloth and ashes as was the, the way to mourn in those days. He wept. He struggled. But he still believed that God knew the bigger picture. And death and suffering came from Satan. Job didn't have the New Testament, but we do. And we hear the words of Jesus himself. Jesus in John 8 is recorded as saying, Satan was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. That's Jesus' account of Satan. And just Jesus compares his character to the character of Satan. And he says the thief, Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. You know, as Christians, we believe that Jesus, who was fully human, yet fully God, came into this world, he died by crucifixion, and he was buried, but that the story doesn't finish there. That's why we celebrate Easter Sunday. That's why we can come to the communion table, because we believe that Christ rose again, triumphant, not only over his own death, but over death for each and every one of us. And by doing so, he made a way for us to live life to the full. Scripture records many sightings of Jesus from his resurrection to his ascension. And he did all of it to conquer death. So that death is no longer the end. But only the start of our life and glory. Hebrews 2 tells us because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Had the power. But the devil no longer has the power of death. Only could Christ set us free. Do you have a fear of dying this morning? Now, I get it if we have a fear of the journey between here and death. What is that going to look like? How hard is that going to be? Is it going to be sudden? Is it going to be long and drawn out? And we have, in many ways, no control and no understanding over why some people die suddenly and what seems easily. And others have to go through long and drawn out pain. We often talk about David's granda, a wonderful man of God and a very special person in my life. Granda got up one morning and he was about 95, 96 years of age, had been married to off them. And he got up one morning saying he wasn't feeling well. Granny went down the stairs in the chairlift because they still lived on their own to get up on the edge of the bed and Granda simply slipped off the edge of the bed and that was him gone. No pain, no suffering, no hospital, none of that that we all dread. He lived a life knowing that God was his saviour and he was taken to glory in just that blink of an eye. That is not the story for every born again believer. That is not the story for every person. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what our death would be like. And hear me this morning when I say that the death of a, 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 a loved one, whether that be a young person or an older person, is a deeply painful thing. As most of you know, I did my first funeral of a stillborn over COVID, a child that had never breathed in this life, and yet for years is horrendous. 
And I have done funerals for people in their 90s and, and, and one or two right into their hundreds or more. But the family still stands and mourns because when we lose someone we love, it is painful and it is difficult. And we have questions. Why God? Why so young? Why so much suffering? Why so much pain? God allows those questions. But my question for you this morning is, do you have hope? Because Jesus wrote, no more relationship issues, no more illness, no more financial worries, no more of whatever it is that pulls you down. That's what's waiting for us in glory being made complete in and through him. That is the promised hope that we have this morning because death has been defeated. We read in the Gospels how Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Today. Jesus promised that that would happen the same day it would be with Jesus in paradise. And we're taught in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where it says, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. Yes, we are fully confident that we would rather be away from this earthly body, for then we will be at home with the Lord. Max Lucado puts it this way, Paradise is the first stage of heaven, but paradise is not the final version of heaven or the ultimate expression of home. The final age will begin when Christ returns on his final day. Thessalonians tells us of that day, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. But before we see angels or hear trumpets or embrace our loved ones, Jeremiah 25 tells us the Lord will roar. John 5 tells us the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. All who are in their graves will hear this voice and they will come out. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death has been defeated. This morning you can have hope. Yes, we worry about what happens between now and then. We worry what that journey may be like. But do you worry about what happens to you afterwards? Or do you have the assurance that if God said today, your time on this earth is over, do you know with that assurance that you have accepted that victory? that it is yours, and that in that moment you will be in the presence of the Lord. The singer-songwriter Matt Redman puts it this way. One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away. No more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all, Jesus. One day every question resolved every anxious thought left behind no more fear one day we will see face to face jesus is there a greater vision of grace in a moment we will be changed on that day and one day we'll be free free indeed jesus one day all the struggle will cease and we will see your glory revealed on that day and when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Is that your hope this morning? Is that your assurance? Are you living in the promise of God? If you haven't made that decision yet, please don't leave this morning without talking to someone. If you're watching online or listening on the telephone, please reach out. We'd love to have that conversation with you. That you have this unshakable hope in your life. That your death has been defeated. And that you will live forever in the presence of God. Amen.
And so this morning we acknowledge that we live in a broken and hurting world. And, and we want to bring that broken and hurting world to God in prayer. So let us pray for others. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the victory that's available to all people through the death, resurrection, and ascension of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that this world is not living how you planned it. And all around we see sickness, pain, disease, death. And Lord, so we bring these people to you this morning. And we pray especially for the peoples of Afghanistan, Lord. Lord, we come to you with this situation with heavy, heavy hearts. It's so complicated a situation, so fast moving and changing, that it's difficult for us to know what to say or how to think. But Lord, this morning we hold before you the people of that country, those who stay and those who have been able to flee. And those, Lord, who are trying to escape the country. Lord, those living with terror and afraid for their future. Those who, because of this latest turn of events, will never be able to live the fullness of life that is your purpose for them. Lord, we pray for guidance this morning for world leaders. Lord, the role that they will play in shaping what happens next with the people of Afghanistan. Give them courage, wisdom, clarity to make God-given decisions. Lord, for the many who are becoming refugees and the people who will be called upon to offer them safety and a future, Lord, we lift them to you this morning. We pray for those even here in Northern Ireland, Lord, who have already started taking in refugees from Afghanistan. Lord, we pray that their every need will be met. Lord, we pray that you would keep them safe from any abuse or intolerance. Lord, may they be surrounded by loving and compassionate people. Lord, we think of those who have been bound to Afghanistan, all those who have served in the armed forces, for those who were injured, and for those whose families are mourning the fact that they never returned. Lord, we hold to you this morning all those who are grieving afresh because of what they experienced in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. Lord, bring them peace. Your peace. This Lord, for those who are waiting for trying to find missing people that they love, may they know your peace. And for those who are still trapped under the rubble, struggling for breath, waiting desperately to be found, Lord, would you guide the workers to them. Lord, that their life would be brought up from the grave. Lord, for all those involved in rescue teams, in the hospitals and those providing care, Lord, would you protect, sustain and guide them. And Lord, we all know people who need your touch this morning. Your touch to heal, to restore, to guide, to bring peace. For all those hurting and struggling and suffering, Lord, in this moment of silence, we remember those close to us who need you today. And Lord, we continue to pray for all those affected by COVID-19. We pray for our hospitals and our nursing homes, all who work in them and manage them. And Lord, we pray especially this morning for those we know who work in any role in health care. Lord, I would ask that you would be their strength and their protection. And Lord, help us to do our part to keep our community. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves this morning. For the stress. Lord, help us this morning to live life in victory through you knowing that our completeness will not happen until we're in your presence. But Lord, help us to live every day in that victory that Jesus himself has conquered sin and death for us. Lord, may we be part of that story. And so, Lord, we ask all these prayers in and through your precious name. Amen. We finish this morning on that note of victory as we sing that wonderful hymn, When the Role is Called Up Yonder. I'll be there. If you can, please stand with us.
morning, that is, that is the testimony of each one of us. And as we go into the week, go into it with the assurance that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is alive. That he has won the victory over death and sin. So go out into this world with joy. Tell those that you meet that Jesus Christ lives. Go without fear, for death has been swallowed up.